right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Larry Farrar. We're at Soderstrom Architects in Portland. It's April 21st, 2022. Larry, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, the first question, we usually ask why wine. We're going to start with why architecture today. How did you get down this path? Well, my father was an architect, so I come by it honestly, I guess. Uh, it's funny, in uh, high school, I think they give me an aptitude test, and I didn't score very high on anything except architecture, so maybe that, that influenced it. Um, probably mostly my dad, though. Um, yeah, it's funny, my, my mother told me after my dad passed away that he once said to her, maybe I should have warned him, <laughs> but he never did. I think he was happy. Um, yeah, it just seemed like the natural thing, natural path uh, when I applied to Colleges. That's I went to a school that had our, went to the architecture program at Washington U. In St. Louis. <laughs> so tell me about before that. Let's talk about back up a little bit. Talk about growing up. Uh, where did you grow I up? Grew up and, in, and in Michigan, outside of Detroit. And uh, it's back when Detroit was a pleasant city. You could I used to take the bus downtown with my friends and hang out at the art museum. And, mm -hmm. yeah, don't know that I'd be doing that. Currently, but uh, it's actually on the way back, I think. And so when you were choosing schools, what made you choose to go to Washington University? Well, <laughs> I actually went to a boys' uh, school outside of Detroit that was designed by a famous architect, Eliel Saarinen, it's Cranbrook School. And uh, that was pretty inspirational uh, as far as architecture goes. Um, this Eliel's son, Aaron Arrow, did the art museum there. He also did the TWA pavilion and, and the St. Louis Arch and things like that. So it was pretty well steeped in architecture. Um, I'm sorry, Les, what was your? Was it, why did you choose to go to school where you did? Oh, college? at Washington. Um, you know, I, I think I just seemed like a good fit. I was. Uh, Definitely wanted to get out of Detroit area. Most of my friends went to U of M, uh, and uh, just wanted something different. Mm -hmm. a friend of mine, uh, <laughs> the real reason, a friend of mine stopped me uh, on the way into class one day, and he said, "Oh, because um, we were all it was, you know, time to apply to schools." And he said, "Well, my sister, uh, I have this application for Washington U. My sister goes there; she really loves it, but I'm not going to apply. So here." <laughs> And there was no essay. <laughs> That's the short answer, the real answer. Why? No, actually, I I had uh, applied to Berkeley as well. Went to Berkeley. Went was on my way out to uh, do a. I did a senior project at our our high school. I had uh, internship things worked out, so I did a senior project with an architect called uh, named Paolo Soleri in in uh, Scottsdale, mm -hmm. Arizona. And on my way out, the plane had to stop over in St. Louis, and I, I already decided to go to Berkeley, but I stopped in St. Louis, and uh, uh, it was a beautiful spring day. Magnolia was blooming. People were so nice, and I was a little hesitant about Berkeley because it was so big, um, and I just changed my mind right then and there. So that's where I went. The Berkeley thing was kind of funny because I went to the interview with my dad because he knew the dean, <laughs> and uh, they just chatted like old times and I was like a fly on the wall. I think, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I was kind of intimidating to me, so I didn't, uh, I wasn't too keen on actually going there, but that's where I was headed before I stopped in St. Louis. Tell me about your experience there and, and the sort of process of becoming an architect from that mm -hmm. point on. Well, so Washington, you had what was a fairly unique uh, program at the time. It was a four-year Bachelor of Arts with a m major in architecture. And then you, the idea is you'd go to a, another two-year school to get a master's. And uh, so it was very steeped in uh, kind of Bauhaus type uh, all-around art architecture. You know, like my sophomore year, I think all we did was do like it was not related to architecture at all. It really, I mean, it was very related, but it wasn't specific to architecture. Is what I mean. We didn't design any buildings, 
we did, you know, uh, sculpture and and uh, printmaking and things like that. So mm -hmm. it was almost uh, a year of art school thrown in there. Um, and then there were other technical courses, of course, but the, the main studio class was more of an art studio. Mm -hmm. and so I, uh, I did. They did have a landscape architecture, a landscape architecture class, which had piqued my interest because I always uh, liked gardening and doing things with plants, horticulture. So I, uh, I just took that one class. It's the only one they offered in the four-year program. But that inspired me to apply to schools that had, for grad school, that had landscape programs as well. And uh, let's see, I, I was debating between Penn and U of O, and I called the office at Penn and wanted to talk to the, someone about uh, the program, and, and they like just put me off, you know, it's like, I had already been accepted, but they weren't willing to spend the time to give me the, information I needed and and uh, I talked to the professor who was in charge of admissions at U of O and he spent like half an hour on the phone with me you know just talking about the light the quality of the light at night and you know a sunset and things like that and you know boy sold <laughs> so uh, I came out here I remember being shocked by Eugene just uh, I expected a bigger city and you know it was just kind of the, the architecture there was pretty, uh, what's the word? I mean, it was just kind of, I was used to big cities, so mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a letdown. But uh, the quality of the teaching there impressed me, and I, I really came to love it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I actually, so I got a degree in architecture, like a major in architecture at Washington U, and then I, uh, in uh, what I didn't understand was that U of O had their architecture school was completely different. They had a, a undergraduate program, which was a five-year degree, and they had a uh, another option for people with previous architecture degrees, which was a master's. But they had another option, which they had just started for people with no architectural experience whatsoever, like bachelor's and other degrees and other things. And they didn't explain that to me. So I got there and, you know, found out that none of my classmates had do anything about architecture, you know, other than the option one people. Mm -hmm. And I was, our studios weren't with theirs. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a letdown, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I was able to, I had fulfilled all my coursework at Washington U had fulfilled all the requirements for U of O's architecture degree, you know, the five-year one. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I ended up taking most of the landscape studios and, and uh, was able to get a combined degree in landscape and architecture, so a master's in each. Mm -hmm. So that, was, that worked out well for me. At that point, what, were you, what did you foresee doing with that? What, what, where were you planning to do next? You know, I... Uh, I wasn't sure. I wanted to. I thought I'd work for a firm that did both. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out there aren't many. I interviewed with a couple. Uh, you know, never got a call back. So I, I went to work for an architecture firm and uh, worked for two or three in Portland. And uh, actually, the Soderstrom Architect is the successor firm of Martin Soderstrom Madsen. And I had actually worked for them in the early 80s. And so it was like coming back. Well, we merged with them about three years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I knew, I still knew some of the partners and, and they asked me if, actually I was having lunch with another architect. Well, I, no, I had, a, had an agreement with another architecture firm to merge and because uh, I was looking towards retirement. And they, uh, that, deal, that deal fell through and I had lunch with Cameron Hyde, who was the one of the, was the managing partner here before he retired. And he he said, "Oh well," I was just telling him about it. He said, "Well, you should come talk to us." So I did, and they they were eager, so it worked out fine. But uh, sorry, I lost the train of your. And the, your well, sort of after college, what were you thinking you were going to oh, do, and then what yeah, happened? Yeah, so well, so I I worked for a couple of firms here. Uh, 
just you know standard architectural intern stuff, toilet room details, kind of exciting things <laughs> like that. Uh, didn't uh, didn't get to dig my teeth into a whole lot of design work, and then through a friend, I met a French architect who uh, gave me a job, and I worked there for. Uh, I worked at actually two different firms in France. Um, met my wife. And uh, you know, there I got to do a lot of design because they, they, their approach is a little different. Architects do beautiful ink drawings. Well, this was at the time before computers. Beautiful ink drawings of uh, their buildings, and you know, the the contractor was in charge of making sure it it worked, not the architect. So different different philosophy there. So the, the architect was definitely the artist. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that. I mean, we got to do a lot of fun projects. Um, got to eat a lot of good food. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the clients of the office there was a f now famous French chef. Uh, he was unknown at the time, mm -hmm. but now he's got 12 Michelin stars. And he couldn't afford to pay his uh, architectural fee, so he paid it in meals for the office. So I got to eat there a lot. It was great. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, but I really didn't. I didn't uh, know exactly what I'd do with the two degrees. Uh, I got fairly fed up when I came back from France, having had this kind of more fun experience, uh, going back to work for an architecture firm here, where I was promised, you know, they will remain nameless, but I was promised, you know, being. Uh, one of the designers, mm -hmm. and turns out I was just a lackey for another designer whose work I didn't like. So I finished the job, and then I, I went out on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, mostly at that time, I did mostly garden design, residential garden design, uh, just because that's what was available. It was uh, tough times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then. Uh, my uh, long, longest associate, Reed, who, Reed Lewis, who retired last year, uh, or at the beginning of this year, he came to talk to me and I said, well, you know, I'm just a one-man office, I'll probably stay that way. I don't foresee needing anyone. And immediately thereafter, like a week later, I won this competition to do a, a design for a fancy residence and I needed help. So I called him back and he spent the uh, last next 30 some years with me. So uh, we worked together pretty well. He was very, very technically oriented and I'm more uh, broad brush mm -hmm. design oriented. Uh, not that he's not a good designer in his own right, but <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, yeah, it seemed like it was like 10 years, but every time I, someone asked how long we'd been working together, I'd say, you know, I'd say, oh, 20 some, and he said, oh, 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I know I can keep track of it because he, when I had to run to the print shop or something, when we were working in my garage, um, he would babysit my kid because my wife was teaching at the French American School here in Portland. And uh, so, you know, if I dash out for an errand, he would keep an eye on my son who was sleeping, but we had a baby monitor in the, in the office. <laughs> so that's how I can keep track with how, how long we work together. Because my son is 34, almost 33. Um, let's see, so when I got back from France, uh, my wife, we, she took a job with the French American School. And that's actually what kicked us into getting married because she needed a green card. So, uh, among other reasons. But. <laughs> so we got married in our living room by a judge who was a, a, lived on the same block. So it was kind of fun, very informal. Um, so she taught kindergarten at the French American School, and lo and behold, who was her uh, pupil? But Lizzie Adelsheim. So. So uh, that's how we met the Adelsheims. At a school had a lot of potlucks, and they brought the wine, and we got to talk. And I actually got interested in wine. I should back up a little bit mm -hmm. um, because my dad uh, was in a wine group in Detroit with uh, the one of the members of the wine group was the 
sommelier at the uh, London Chop House in Detroit, which was at the time a famous restaurant. And if Wine Spectator, Spectator had a list of great wine restaurants back then, they would have been on it. Um, so he brought the wines, or picked the wines that they would taste. And uh, I came home from Thanksgiving vacation, my, my sophomore year in college at Washington U, and, and uh, he was on the docket to have the, it was his turn to have the, the wine tasting at our house. So it was a vertical of a white burgundies, mm -hmm. and it was my introduction to wine. It's pretty stellar. <laughs> so I was spoiled from the get-go. Um, interestingly, there, there were no women allowed at the time. My mother was furious. I would, uh, you know, she did all the, all the, the cooking, uh, all the, the side dishes, and uh, but they, you know, they didn't let her come taste the wine. So I would sneak out with samples for her. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad. Wow. Uh, so anyway, I. I met David uh, and Jenny. They, you know, came over for dinner at our house, and uh, you know, we came out with dinner at their house. And I remember once we uh, we went on a wine tasting tour through the school, and we didn't know where it was going. But this bus just pulls into uh, this house, and it was turns out to be David and Jenny's house. And, and uh, Jenny came out and. Marivon recognized her, my wife, and they, you know, hugging, and mm -hmm. you know, it was just funny because uh, neither of us expected. We didn't know where we were going. We didn't know it would be someone we knew. So uh, anyway, David uh, had worked with, as you know, probably he worked with Robert Duran to to find some property here, and, and then he also recommended us as architects. So we interviewed, but I, we didn't get the job. Uh, actually, my former uh, employer got the job, which is ironic. They got fired later on. But, but uh, I think uh, Ernie Munch shared office space with them, so um, they, they, I had encouraged them to use a landscape architect as well. And by the way, I, you know, I'm one. Um, but it kind of backfired because I think they, it, it was just Reed and me, and I think they just didn't think we could handle their project, mm -hmm. so so uh, they ended up hiring Doug Macy, who's a pretty well-known landscape architect, uh, and Ernie shared office space with him. So I I suspect that's how you know how he got the connection to the job when SRG, the other firm, was laid up, was replaced. Shall we say. Anyway, so but that piqued my interest. I mean, I thought you know, speaking being. Having uh, lived in France, speaking French, you know, I was real gung ho on this thing, but they were a little less gung ho mm -hmm. on us. But uh, it turns out Robert speaks perfect English, so he didn't care if <laughs> someone spoke French or not. Um, but that piqued my interest in, in wineries, and uh, I didn't really think about it uh, for a couple of years. I mean, I thought that would be a, would have been a great job. Uh, too bad we didn't get it. Um, but we went back to doing our residential remodels and gardens, and, you know, occasional house, and uh, didn't think much more of it. And then a couple of years later, David called me up and said, "So, uh, I'd like to, you to come out and talk to me about doing a winery." And uh, I thought, "Cool." So I went out there. It was you know, like nine o'clock in the morning or something. We sat down at the table, and I said, "So, uh, you're going to build an, uh, you're going to remodel this." Winery of yours, which was in the basement of their house. He said, "No, we're going to build a completely new one." And I said, "Oh, okay." So you're interviewing architects? He said, "No, you're it." <laughs> so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we spent. I spent the whole day there. I think I stayed for dinner. Uh, David just downloaded everything he could could about you know what's required in a winery. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a crash course in one day. Uh, we went to look at the site, of course, and, and uh, which was not far from their house. And uh, yeah, I got pretty jazzed about it. Went uh, we, David and his winemaker, Don Kautzner, at the time, and I went to California. Well, first we went around Oregon looking at things, the other wineries. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, then we went to California, looked at some down there, and it, actually between phase one and phase two of his project, getting a little ahead of myself, but uh, David Dunn and I also went to Italy and, and France to look at wineries. So uh, the fascinating thing was that the two of them didn't really agree, and I didn't know anything. So I was just like a fly on the wall and listening to their them to debate the pros and cons of various approaches. So it was, uh, it was a fabulous education. Mm -hmm. you know? So the first phase was what we did. We kind of did a plan uh, for the whole build out, but they could only afford to build the so it was a U shape, mm -hmm. and they could only afford to build the center section, which was we decided would just be a white wine winery. A big tank room, a giant press, and then uh, a couple years later, or it may have been three, I can't remember, um, the Loackers came on board and uh, purchased an interest mm -hmm. in the winery. And, and uh, as I remember, David, you know, was paying me over time for my fee from the first phase, but but and then we talked about I might just become an equity, you know, use it for equity and mm -hmm. the thing. But when the Loackers came on board, they didn't want any any other. Uh, involvement, so mm -hmm. they they paid me in full. <laughs> I couldn't complain about that. So uh, anyway, it's uh, the first phase was just white wine winery, and then a couple years later we came back and and uh, added the whole thing. I thought we might do it in like four or five phases, mm -hmm. but they just did the whole original master plan. So that was great. Mm -hmm. um, Subsequent, we did like four or five other, uh, no, two or three other additions to it. I think we've done five projects with David, all of, you know, over the years. Um, the last, the fifth one was the was the uh, replacing the, so the uh, tasting room re replaced the offices, and the offices moved. The idea was we'd move them into a separate building, which we designed, but they ended up. Uh, just to putting it in a portable, and that was like 15 years ago, I think. <laughs> so they're still in the portable. We still have the plans. <laughs> Any time now. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious before we move forward here, as you mentioned, kind of getting the crash course education, both from the tours you were taking and from listening to, the, the, to them talk. What did you see from your perspective as you started to kind of gain a perspective on that? What did you see as the the what were the elements the best the best winery buildings had, and what what did you kind of foresee as ne necessities? Yeah. Well, so uh, specifically, we were kind of looking, and certainly in California, we were looking at gravity flow facilities. And uh, you know, frankly, there weren't a lot of uh, you know Cabernet. You know, doesn't mind being pumped and mm -hmm. beat up. In fact, we our second project was with Leonetti in uh, Walla Walla and you know and I was you know ask him about gravity and he's going ah, you know Cabernet loves to be beat up you know so he wasn't the least bit interested in gentle fruit handling um, at the time you know I think uh, Opus One was was uh, brand new mm -hmm. and I think uh, they were they were making use of gravity but other than that you know there weren't a lot uh, but we looked at all kinds of aspects, tasting rooms, hospitality, things like that. Um, but that was definitely the focus was on the processing flow and uh, gravity or not. Mm -hmm. I, re I remember we would do drive-by tours. I mean, David was in his old Volvo. Was, uh, we'd pull into a, into a winery, drive around back, see if there was a must pump, and if there was a must pump, we'd, we'd leave. <laughs> you know. So it was, uh, some of them were pretty quick, mm -hmm. but uh, we did, uh, I remember we went to Bouchain, um, and Bouchain had a barrel room that was uh, hand stacked, and, and uh, I, David was talking to, to uh, uh, winemaker whose name escapes me, uh, John Montero, mm -hmm. the winemaker at the time. Um, they were chatting about something, and, and Don and I wandered off into the barrel room, and, and Don, oh, actually, Don said, "Come here." <laughs> it's like, and uh, he said, uh, "This is 
this is what I want with the barrel in the barrel room. I mean, we change it a little. Don was big on the idea of uh, never boxing yourself in, mm -hmm. and always having a second way out from wherever you were working in the winery, uh, which was, you know, enlightening. Um, but he had 13 years working in David's basement to think about uh, what he wanted in the winery, mm -hmm. and so he was, you know, he he knew exactly what he wanted. Uh, David didn't always agree, but but that's why he told me to come in the in the uh, barrel room while David mm -hmm. was otherwise occupied and show me what he wanted. So so uh, we pretty much did what he wanted. And uh, interesting, that was another good lesson because when uh, Don left and David Page took over, uh, those barrel rooms didn't David didn't like them at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were completely. Uh, antithetical to his way of making wine. So that was a great lesson in flexibility, mm -hmm. you know. I think, uh, you know, no two winemakers see eye to eye on mm -hmm. the best way to do things, so it's interesting. Um, so uh, from, your pers from your perspective then, I'm curious, as you were touring all these places, what did you think of sort of winery architecture of the time? Were there were you seeing buildings that impressed you, or were you seeing well, buildings that were functional? You know, I researched it in, you know, all the architecture magazines. I looked up wineries, and there were only like two or three articles, you know, in the last 15 years. You know, and one of them was Mario Boda's winery in Italy. That's, you know, it's like a, just has a bunch of trees growing on it. That's its claim to fame. <laughs> you know, it's very, uh, it's like a. I don't know if you've seen the, the Contemporary Muse Art Museum in in San Francisco? No. Uh, it's like a cylinder that's cut at an angle, mm -hmm. and it, uh, this building looks just like it, the winery he did, except that the sliced angle, he's got trees planted. Uh, you know, they had nothing to do, all the ones that were in the showcase, in the articles had nothing to do with wine processing. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all show places for, mm -hmm. you know, architect's ego or something. So Claude, Claude Bagas was there, was, there was an article about that one. I think that had just been completed. Mm -hmm. um, that was Michael Graves. So you can imagine what it was like. Anyway, uh, so there really weren't a lot of examples of, uh, and nothing I could find in research, so it was really, you know, just what I learned from Don and David. Mm -hmm. Um, trying to think, I mean, David did, David and Ginny did express that they wanted something uh, with a Tuscan feel, you know, which I didn't really like the Disneyland aspect of that, but we tried to interpret it with uh, modern materials, so mm -hmm. that's kind of where the tower and what that came from. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. So, uh, your question was, uh, I was oh, right, right. So, what about as you were as you were just driving around and seeing other buildings? Were there were there any kind of impressive, impressively architectural buildings? In general, yeah, of the yeah. wineries you saw. Of uh, the wineries, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, well, certainly in Oregon. I mean, Opus One was very impressive, mm -hmm. uh, but it was kind of pseudo Egyptian, and mm -hmm. you know, um, I'd say that was. The most impressive, just. But we were really looking at functional things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we went to Calera, which is in an old quarry, uh, and it looked like it was still a quarry. You know, a quarry with catwalks. So, you know, mm -hmm. but the function, it was one mm -hmm. of the few gravity, fully gravity wineries, at the time. And we went to DDO, which was obviously a gravity winery because mm -hmm. that's. That's where Robert was coming from. Um, but uh, the other thing was, you know, we looked at, and I, I can't remember exactly the timeline, but one of the things that came out of, you know, visiting wineries, which was that there were different approaches in terms of just loading the fermenters. Uh, some, some people had a fixed sorting line. Sorting lines were new at the time. Mm -hmm. That was you know, early 90s, and there weren't a lot of people sorting fruit. Um, but, you know, we went to visit a few. Most of them, um, you know, you sorted the fruit into, or either you sorted the fruit into a bin and dumped the bin, 
into the fermenter or you you uh, move the whole sorting line down the down the row of fermenters and fill them one after another, mm -hmm. um, which you know in terms of aligning all that equipment was kind of a nightmare. But we didn't know that at the time, and that that was the first phase of Adelson was done that way. Uh, you know, so they had two concrete catwalks and the sorting line and the stemmer and all that moved down the mm -hmm. down the aisle and service tanks on both sides. And uh, I'm trying to think the other option, which I think I first saw at a California winery. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's in uh, uh, more Southern California, mm -hmm. uh, Paso, that area. Uh, I can't remember the name. But anyway, it's uh, they moved large, really large fermenters to the sorting line, so they had a fixed sorting line and moved very large tanks, like six, seven ton tanks, into place with electric pallet jacks, uh, monster pallet jacks. Mm -hmm. In fact, Ted, uh, Ted adopted that, mm -hmm. Ted Lemon adopted that uh, technique and bought their old pallet jacks, because I think they abandoned it, <laughs> um, or bought one of them. Um, but that was a whole, you know, that was kind of, wow, that's, that's a cool mm -hmm. idea. Um, and then when we, we were working on Lemelson, we came up with the uh, idea of a kind of a gantry that went up and down. Uh, so you, you could just, you didn't have to realign everything, it was all set. Um, but it could still move. So we used the trench drains uh, as tracks, like railroad tracks, to have like railroad wheels that guy did this, what they call the lunar lander, uh, up and down the, the row of fermenters on each side. So that was kind of kind of fun, and the guy who built it was did a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that actually was modeled after something that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't have a mental block on names here. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, I think is his name. I can't even remember the name of the winery. He was making wine at Lemelson the first year, mm -hmm. um, but we had seen something he had built for Medi Medici. Oh, um, yeah. Dean Fisher. Dean Fisher from yeah. Medea, yeah. yeah. Dean Fisher. So he, he built uh, the one at Medici, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I took some community college classes that were tours of local wineries, and we ended up at Medici and saw that thing and said, oh, we could put that on wheels. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of where that idea came from. We started with the idea of a gantry crane, but we realized that with the people on the catwalks doing the punch down, you know, if that gantry came around, it just decapitate them, so <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> so uh, we ended up with this vehicle that went down the, down the middle aisle. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, Dean built that one at Medici. Subsequent to that, I, they've, I've seen uh, uh, Josh Bergstrom uses the same concept, I think. He raised it up a little bit so he could get slightly larger fermenters other than you know just bins underneath it. Mm -hmm. the originally, that concept started with four-ton bins and, mm -hmm. and uh, or maybe two-ton bins, four-foot by four-foot cubes, basically. Uh, but then, it uh, evolved to actual JV Northwest started making, cranking out two-ton tanks and stainless, and they fit under it. So that's kind of, you know, the thing that has always impressed me about the Oregon wine industry, and you know, I've heard a lot of people say it, is just how collaborative people are, and you know, they welcomed us in to look, uh, mm -hmm. look at what, how, they, how they did things, and mm -hmm. we picked up a lot of good ideas. Mm -hmm. California too, for the most part, some were very, no. <laughs> but mostly they were very welcoming. So after the Alstein project, I know you you have a number of other winery projects. Did at what point did it become? Did you become like the winery person? At what point did people be sort of come start coming to you with their projects? Yeah, well, actually, all our work, I think, is word of mouth. So. Um, 
I don't really know when it started, but clearly the fact that David uh, was very connected in the wine industry helped. Um, uh, Gary Figgins from Leonetti came over to look at the, the sellers at uh, at Alzheim and really liked them and you know asked hired us to do his winery. Mm -hmm. um, so an interesting thing is those precast sellers. I because I'm a landscape architect, a landscape architect and specifier news magazine sent me trade magazines every month, and one of them had a picture of a, a bridge culvert, you know, and that's I looked at it and go, that's what we've been looking for because we had the size and the dimensions of the cellars we were working on at Adelsheim, but we didn't know how to build them. And uh, we saw these built bridge culverts, and I called the company and said, yeah, sure, we could adapt those. So it turns out that the, the company had a precast yard in Tualatin, and uh, we worked with them to, you know, make the bail off cellars, uh, I think we had 40 of these, you know, 10 by 20 foot arched units uh, made and uh, they put them up they put them in in, in uh, two days so all those the four barrel rooms at Adelsheim's went in in two days I remember Harry Peterson Edry, uh I ran into him later he says well I saw your uh, your trucks going by with them. <laughs> so it took me a while scratching my head to wonder where they were going but now I know so it's kind of funny um, so Gary Figgins really liked those. We were working on his project, and that was the next one after Adelsheim, and he wanted those. But the, the deal was, turns out that the Tuolumne Yard was the closest one, and that's a long way from Walla Walla. Mm -hmm. And the trucking was just the freight. We priced it, it was gonna be crazy. Well, it turns out there was a concrete uh, company in, in uh, Walla Walla that their father, it's in the Nairam brothers, and their father had built a bunch of the tanks at Hanford, concrete, so, you know, the contractors, and the contractor and I asked them, you know, is this something you could do? He said, oh yeah, that's no problem. And uh, so they built them in there. Well, they, they actually built, they cast them in place, so they, they came up with a triple form that was steel, poured one section and then dropped the form, moved it 10 feet, mm -hmm. raised it back up, poured another section and poured it right right there. So they just dug a giant hole, put these tracks in like on railroad tracks, ran the forms down those, poured them, it took a lot longer because they could only pour one every 10 days. But, uh, and I think Lemo, uh, Leonetti is longer than, than Adelsheim, mm -hmm. but but uh, so those guys, you know, built them and did a beautiful job. We actually colored the concrete there, so, and they polished it once done. The late Andy cellars look like they're made of marble. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's how we, we uh, yeah, so Adelsheim led to, mm -hmm. to uh, Leonetti. I don't know, and that led to Pepper Bridge, which we also used the same vaults, we just stuck an extension in there and raised them up higher because they wanted to do Western Square racks and not hand stack. Um, so then about the same time we were working on uh, Leonetti, we, we, uh, I met Eric Lemelson and he asked us to design his winery. And so we were working on both of those, Leonetti, Pepper Bridge, and Lemelson all at once, which was you know, we'd started as a two-person office, so we, we grew to about nine. Mm -hmm. And uh, even then, you know, I think there were there were some details that Purple Bridge trench drains kind of got uh, got away from us a little bit. Mm -hmm. We sh should have paid more attention to that. Reed was uh, our technical uh, expert, and he was spread pretty thin. So mm -hmm. uh, I think he wasn't even involved in Pepper Bridge. So I can't blame him for any of those problems. <laughs> they were minor, but but uh, kind of stick in your craw mm -hmm. you, when you screw up something. Uh, let's see, then uh, we did a Loro 
after that, I think in 2002, I was working with Ted on a project in California, Keller Estate, mm -hmm. with uh, the fairly famous Mexican architect, Legoretta. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, they, they didn't end up building it, but it was a beautiful design. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then we got a John Montero from Bouchain. I had met him when we visited with David, and and uh, we became friends. Well, I think we I met John and his wife at the at the uh, Adelsheim's had a picnic every year after the IPNC, and uh, we got to know each other there and stayed in touch. And then uh, John uh, got a consulting job to do a because they, they were moving to New Zealand. So he got a consulting job uh, from uh, Wal uh, Philip Wollstone in New Zealand, Nelson. And uh, he brought well, Philip here to look at some of our projects. And just before, uh, you know, I, I, I had, uh, actually he was the second New Zealander who came here. Uh, oh. I'm trying to remember, that Larry uh, McKenna came and mm -hmm. looked at our, he brought his architect and they looked at spend a day with them looking at projects, which was kind of fun. Um, but I never, it never occurred to me that we'd get to actually do a project there. But uh, Philip uh, spent a couple of days with us looking at stuff, and, and uh, I remember we ran it, we were at the Dundee Bistro, and Harry Peterson Nedry comes up and said, we introduced Philip, and, and he said, oh, so Larry, are you going to do a winery in uh, New Zealand? And I go, yeah, right, you know. And uh, yeah, didn't even think about it. Well, that night, uh, Philip called me up, said, "Say, I got a nine o'clock plane tomorrow morning, but you, could you meet me early?" And I said, "Sure." And uh, he gave me the job to do his project, so that was pretty exciting. So I got to go to New Zealand a couple of times, and uh, I spent the first John. John was John, and I both spent the like first ten days there, uh, just working with uh, the local architect and in their office and coming up with the design. And uh, so I actually, as computers were just coming into the fore, mm -hmm. com computer design, so, you know, we described what we wanted and their draftsman put it on a computer, handed me a disc and sent me on my way back back to Portland. And, you know, we, we worked on it just from that one disc, you know, came back with the design and and uh, so well, quite a bit of back and forth in schematic design with the locals. And uh, yeah, got that done. Uh, they, uh, w we didn't make the grand opening, but my wife and I went about a month later and, and uh, got to see it finished, so that was fun. Were there significant challenges to that, to not always being there? Um, sure, there were some, I mean, the structural engineer made some decisions I would have pushed back on. You know, just, you know, they made some changes on the fly that aesthetically weren't the greatest. <laughs> and Reed had spent hours uh, doing the, the blended, it's sort of, I don't know if you, the, the model for it was the Weyerhaeuser headquarters up in, uh, uh, Federal way, mm -hmm. so you know terrace, terrace, planted roof, and uh, it was kind of that concept. But they redid, uh, done the grading, you know, the plan for how to move the earth around, uh, so it just flowed beautifully into the landscape. Well, it turns out that Philip particularly liked uh, gabions, which are the rock-filled baskets, so put those all over the, you know, gave me the walls and it's like, instead of s smoothly flowing, it, it's kind of like, oh. <laughs> anyway, there's kind of a, that in the overhead, uh, they, the gable was uh, symmetrical on the end and they, they chopped it off. I don't even know why, but, you know, so I couldn't control all of it mm -hmm. from afar, mm -hmm. but, uh, on the whole, I think it came out pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so then, uh, oh, oh, funny story about that. So in our our hand brochure at the time, which we put together, uh, Philip had, I think I gave him one at some point. He saw 
uh, WA for Washington, for this was the Red Hills, mm -hmm. uh, not Red Hills, Red Mountain mm -hmm. uh, project we did up there. And it, so it was just a picture of it said Red Mountain Vineyards, uh, WA. And for some reason he thought it was Western Australia. So he thought, oh, uh, you've worked in the Southern Hemisphere before. <laughs> no, actually that's uh, Washington. Anyway, that's kind of funny. But uh, at, at this point, as you were as you were doing more and more of these, tell me about the the kind of the function versus artistic the the balance you're striking as you're trying to as you're designing. Obviously, function is so important for these buildings, but you want them to have a sense of style as well. So, mm -hmm. tell me about that. Did you come up with certain hallmarks or trademarks that were kind of un that were through lines, or was each building fairly mm -hmm. unique a unique design? Uh, they were definitely a unique design. I mean, our our whole shtick is, you know, trying to blend the site and the winery, mm -hmm. um, or the building in general. Um, not necessarily a winery, but, but uh, you know, I describe it as similar to the idea of a terroir. You know, you've got, you got the site, you got the process, you got the, you know, cultural milieu, you know, mm -hmm. Oregon agricultural, rural, thing going. Um, so we try and, you know, approach those as uh, givens and, you know, how to make something fit within that. But, I mean, for instance, in our own house, um, we built it about 25 years ago, but, you know, almost from the get-go, people would say, so is this a new house or is this a remodel? Which I took as a huge compliment, you know, because it, we, carefully trying to fit it in with the existing trees and mm -hmm. whatnot. So I figure I had succeeded when I got comments like questions like that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, you know, I don't think, I mean, there are things that we used over and over again with variations like the, the, mm -hmm. the cut and cover caves. Um, you know, we used those at, at Aloro, we used them at Leonetti, Adelsheim, Lemelson's, Lemelson's were Again, Eric had never made wine, and he didn't know really whether he wanted to use Western Square racks or barrel stack, um, you know, pyramid stacks. So uh, to give him the freedom to do that, to have that option, we, we made them quite tall and wider spans. And the, the company here, the local company, was still in business, and they were able to tweak the form to whatever we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but then they they went out of business, and um, we still, you know, had conversations with the the mother company in Ohio. But the local franchise went out of business, uh, and there was no one nowhere close to make them. Um, so we used uh, the guys from Walla Walla on the Laurel. They came over here and did the same thing. They built built them, stayed in a hotel, you know, <laughs> motel for a month while mm -hmm. they built that. Mm -hmm. But uh, then on Apassionata, or J. Christopher, um, we used the same system, but we arranged them in a, like a spoke, spoke on wheels, and they had a central hub that became the, the workroom for the, mm -hmm. you know, doing the barrel work. Um, and uh, so there were kind of variations on the theme. Mm -hmm. um, those were actually made in Walla Walla. The guys from Walla Walla decided, well, we should probably just set up to do it here as a precast and chuck them over. So I don't know what happened. That was the only alternative at the time. It was cheaper for them to truck them than to come and stay here. And they were you know, plenty busy over in Walla Walla. So <laughs> the beauty of that was they could make them uh, like over the winter, we could get the site prepped, ready to go. And they could be working on them uh, till it was the weather was better to mm -hmm. bring them over. Mm -hmm. And the advantage there was that they could, you know, if they had leftover concrete from a job, they could they could make a vault. You mm -hmm. know? So that worked out well. Mm -hmm. um, so from from then on, we've used them even to this day. Uh, the last project we had built, Abbott Claim, mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't done in Walla Walla, and. Instead, the variation there was that instead of uh, 
uh, you know, straight 10 by 20s, that squares, rectangles, they were pie shaped, so they formed a semicircle. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of a fun variation. Mm -hmm. and, I've uh, seen that room, that's yeah, very impressive. It's, uh, you know, kind of a, one grew out of another, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think El Loro was quite small, you know, I think they only used, I don't know, 10 volts or something. Mm -hmm. So I think they realized it just wasn't worth their time to, to bring all that stuff over and work here. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they were available as precasts for future projects. And then they didn't mind modifying the form, you know, to make it pie shaped. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. no big deal for them. You, you had mentioned uh, flexibility earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about how that has how that has developed in your work. How have you? Has there been? I assume there's been more demand for flexible spaces. How have you kind of incorporated that into your designs as you've gone through? So interestingly enough, you know, gravity was the huge driving factor early on. Mm -hmm. It's become less so. I mean, I think, uh, for instance, Alexana uh, is three levels: um, two in the winery itself, and then the, the driveway is at the crush pad is at a higher level, um, and that pretty much mimics uh, Penner Ash's design. Mm -hmm. We worked with Lynn on, on uh, Alexana. Um, but that that seemed to be kind of a, if you wanted gravity at the, to load the fermenters, mm -hmm. and then one more level was enough, you know, you could, because a place like Adelsheim that had more levels, you had to, you still had to get the wine up to, to tanks to, to bottle. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, you kind of, you could go to ridiculous lengths like Archery Summit with an elevator, but you know it, it just it wasn't practical or, mm -hmm. or efficient. So um, we kind of come to the place where uh, most most of our clients now are, are either going single level and just loading. Uh, you know, if they have a fixed sorting line, they load a transfer vessel, either a bin or something with a valve on the bottom that they can just lift up with a forklift and open the valve and fill it. Fill up fermenter. Mm -hmm. um, some are still eager on the on the uh, loading directly into mm -hmm. the fermenters, like Alex, Alexana. But even Alexana doesn't. We have a it's a hybrid system because we have some fixed fermenters you can load directly into, and then there's a loading bay for smaller fermenters, and then you um, that was Lynn's concept with a, of a nursing station mm -hmm. where you take the mobile fermenter and put them in groups of four, and you have uh, heating and cooling stations at each one of those groups of four. There's no, no hard, fast rule. It mm -hmm. could be a group of six, but uh, we had, you know, what we called spider boxes. So there was a, a manifold that came out and then you could feed each tank in the mm -hmm. row. Uh, but, you know, once the harvest was done, you could clear the floor, stack the fermenters up in the corner, and you had all that space for potentially for hospitality or other uses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. storage, bottling. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, one thing that always fascinated me was how different winemakers, where gravity was important to them. Like, uh, so I met Steve Kistler when in that original uh, tour that David mm -hmm. Don and I did in, in uh, California. And like 10 years later, I got a call from him uh, that he wanted to do a new winery. And, and uh, so we worked with, it's kind of a sad story for us. We, we worked three years in the building, got him a building permit, and uh, that's the day he sold the, <laughs> sold the, the winery. So uh, it never got built. The new owner wasn't interested. They were more interested in hospitality, I think, than mm -hmm. expanding production. So, uh, but Steve had a very interesting take on gravity. He didn't mind dumping, you know, he was, didn't mind loading a ferment, uh, transfer vessel and bin, dumping it into the, over the top of the fermenter. That wasn't where he wanted gravity. He wanted gravity at the bottling stage mm -hmm. when it was finished, finished wine. So we actually had a giant plant, a row of uh, bottling tanks on top of that plant. And then we sunk the paddle. The truck dock, so the so the bottling truck, which he owned with one other winery, I think. Um, so it was came in low enough so that the 
top of the bottom of the tanks was below the filler bowl, was above the filler bowl on the uh, on the uh, bottling line, and he could gravity flow the bottling. But otherwise, it was just a two-level two-level mm -hmm. winery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that that uh, it was just very interesting to me how the concept of gravity is one thing, but where you use it, mm -hmm. each winemaker is completely different opinion. A lot of winemakers don't want to use it at all. They'd rather have a flat, you know, easy flow. Uh, but Lingua Franca and Abbott Claim are most recent ones are are uh, just two levels and it's only like a half a level up uh, press the press is down at tank level, fermentation room level and uh, they load it from four feet high higher up. So anyway. It's uh, just interesting concepts. For sure. At this point, you must have a pretty good idea of, of wine production and, and, and the, the, the stages and the process yeah. and all well, of that. I have to say, I came away from that uh, first day spent with David. Uh, he did a little diagram. <laughs> and uh, I probably still have it somewhere. Uh, but, you know, he did a great job of explaining it to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it took a while to sink in. but. Because I would do things like, oh no, that won't work. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of preference. I mean, I I would say that the most common answer I get when I or meeting with the winemaker for the first or second time is, you know, when you ask them a question about the process and they say, oh, it depends. <laughs> so. Getting a straight answer is not always easy. <laughs> well, think about it and let us know. Because <laughs> there's just so many variables they, they have in their mind. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. So outside of Oregon, you mentioned obviously New Zealand. You, you, you talked about working with Ted at Literary and some other mm -hmm. projects in California. Where else, what else have you worked on outside of the state? Um, so we did a project in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. Newport Vineyards. Um, it was an old Chrysler dealership. Uh, that uh, they had been using as a winery, but not very efficiently. So we spent uh, two, three years working with them, and they finally got it built. It was also a restaurant. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of cool. The, the restaurant, instead of garage doors going up, uh, they drop down and look over the wine fermentation room. So I can feel eating in the restaurant. You can feel a part of the winery. Mm -hmm. um, and then we. We uh, we actually I actually consulted on a project in uh, a sparkling project in uh, England mm -hmm. night timber and uh, we just did the programming for them because their architect had never done a winery and then uh, uh, we did a project in Nova Scotia with a local pretty well known architect McKay Lyons McKay Lyons Sweet Apple is the name of the firm um, again it didn't get built, mm -hmm. but uh, we were involved in that for a while. Um, most of our out-of-country work most recently has been in BC. Uh, we've worked on Martin's Lane with uh, Olson Kandig out of Seattle, and uh, we were their winery design consultants. And since then, we've worked with them on about three or four other projects. We're actually working on one now in California with them, and we're doing a another project for the same client as Martin's Lane, uh, just on our own, it's more of a production winery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's underway right now. Um, what else? Uh, we did a, another project in New Zealand that didn't get built for Blake, Mark Blake. Uh, he's out of San Francisco, but he had a vineyard over there. And, uh, we got through uh, design work and estimates, and I think at that point, uh, he realized that with a young family commuting to New Zealand probably wasn't the best thing to be doing. So uh, that he sold the vineyard. Mm -hmm. That one, on, that one never got built. Uh, there's other ones. I think the other ones are all local. Mm -hmm. In in the state, then you mentioned uh, Abbott Claim, Lingua Franca being the the two new two of their newest mm -hmm. projects. Uh, compare and contrast those for me with your early stuff, with 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 Limelson, with Leonetti, with Adelson. What's what are the biggest changes now 
an overall kind of aesthetic and overall mm -hmm. um, of, of, of the newer wine buildings versus yeah. the, kind of the first ones you built? Well, I think in general there's a trend to maybe being more open to modern modern stuff, not not uh, you know pseudo Tuscan. Mm -hmm. um, although there's plenty of that going around. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so Lingua Franca is pretty much. I mean, I think of it as a winemaker's winery. It was done with Dominique Lafon and, uh, and uh, Thomas Savre. They they both knew pretty much what they wanted and. They wanted gravity, but not, you know, not uh, extreme. So, and that really, Alban de Milieu made wine at Lingua Franca mm -hmm. his first year with Abbott Claim, so, so he was pretty steeped in that concept. And uh, they're pretty much, you know, the aesthetics differ, mm -hmm. uh, the budgets differ, uh, but the concept of, you know, the Gravity, use of gravity is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing at uh, Lingua Franca for me was uh, Dominique was very clear that he wanted uh, a clean side and a dirty side. So the crush pad is, you know, it gets grapes everywhere. You know, the presses are out there, the stemmer, all that stuff. Um, and Inside, there's a, there's a door, and then the fermentation room. They want to keep mm -hmm. spotless. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was an, a concept I hadn't heard before, but it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and that pretty much carried through on uh, on uh, Abbott claim as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, in general, I think you know, like I was saying, the gravity became maybe less less important. I think pumps have gotten a lot gentler, and you know, people realize that you can do it. Without it, and it's it is fabulously expensive. I mean, exponentially more. Uh, the more levels you have, you know, just basically a, a you know a step building is like a dam. You have to hold back all the drainage and pipe it around, and it's just you know the the soil pressures get exponentially bigger the deeper you go. So especially on a slope. On the other hand. You know, if a client has a slope site, you pretty much have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise you're filling all that stuff below. So, one of our biggest challenges, uh, I'd have to say, is getting uh, full-size semi trucks in and out of these sites. You know, and in a recent case when you just can't do it, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. um, you have to. Fire department have maximum grades, you know, for approach. They have to get their fire apparatus in there. And it, uh, if the site's perfect for a super gravity winery, you probably can't get the truck in there. So, yeah, it's not the fire trucks that are the problem. It's the mobile bottling trucks because yeah, they're they're 65 feet. Mm -hmm. They don't turn on a dime. Um, other than that, I'm trying to think of what else. So, more there's much more emphasis on hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I originally, early on in the process, in the design of David's place, I said, you know, you're going to do a tasting room because you know California wineries had tasting rooms. He said, over my dead body. You know, about uh, five years after we finished the the full build out. Um, what we felt was the full build-up. Uh, Michael Adelsheim said, you know, we got to do a taster. We talked David in and tasted. And uh, I, I said, I reminded him that he had, that his brother had said over my dead body. And uh, so I didn't say anything, but then a couple of years later, probably David said, oh, so we want to convert the offices to a tasting room. I went, okay. <laughs> um, and then it also, Added on to uh, the fermentation room, which was much more the the uh, mobile mm -hmm. mobile fermenter model mm -hmm. uh, that, that David and you know a barrel room that was on Western Square Rack. So mm -hmm. David Page was happy. He got, <laughs> he got his his two cents on the design. Um, but in general, I think uh, you know 
it's, there's much more emphasis on hospitality now. And you know, you, I would see it evolving because you know, we would do these fermentation rooms and trench drains and all that, and you know, we'd have to come up with a cover because they would entertain in there, and you know, women with high heels would mm -hmm. break their heels off in the mm -hmm. trench drain. So, so we we had to think differently about dual use of spaces and things like that. That's just a tiny detail, but there's also you know, just there were. Let's put it this way, there were hazards in fermentation rooms that if you knew the public was going to be in there, you would have done it that way. So, so. It sort of felt to us, to me, going to wineries, that at some point, no one ever considered the public would ever want to be in the yeah. workspace. Right. And then they realized that the opposite of that was true. The public yeah. did want to be in the workspace, yeah. Yeah. and they had to adjust. Mm -hmm. that, that's, how, that's how it felt yeah. to you as well, yeah. Definitely. And we didn't even put, well, we had freeze protection in the fermentation, but we didn't have heat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a, like a lingua franca. They had a, they had a uh, event in the, in the tasting rooms, and they had to turn the, turn the unit heaters at the, on the ceiling on like three days in advance to get it warm. <laughs> it was, there was no wine in there at the time. But, mm -hmm. but you, know, uh, you know, if we had a to-do ever again, we probably would have mm -hmm. had larger heating units. I want to talk about that. Actually, that's actually my next question is about sort of learning from mistakes. Clearly, it's it's true. It's clear from listening to you talk that the mistakes stick with you. The oh, yeah. even even the small <laughs> ones. Yeah. And so tell me about about learning from them and about you know is is it is it possible to build like a perfect winery building? No. <laughs> uh, I should say that when uh, I remember when Don and David and I went to Italy and France to look at wineries, it was just before we got started uh, on phase two. Mm -hmm. And David made the comment that uh, I was, people, someone asked him, why, why are you doing this tour? And uh, he said, well, we, we want to avoid the latest mistakes, <laughs> which I thought was pretty, pretty astute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, whenever I go to a winery, I say, visit a winery, I'll ask the winemaker what doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, uh, it's just good. Good thing to know, mm -hmm. um, and we've we've made plenty of mistakes, and hopefully have learned from them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, so there's been a lot of evolution in terms of gravity, specifically with new technical innovations, mm -hmm. and you know, distemmers change and the heights change and all that stuff. So, you know, we really need to know what what the what the equipment is going to be, but we also need to be flexible because, you know, they might use it for two years and decide they hate it, you know, so it's got to work mm -hmm. uh, beyond specific equipment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we need to make sure we have enough room for it. So a lot of what we do is uh, when we get a job, we'll, you know, sit down with the winemaker, go over a questionnaire, try and pin down what equipment he's got in mind, and then uh, We'll do what's called a vignette, which is what we call a vignette. It, you draw the piece of equipment in plan and, and section, and you can pin down the clearances you need. Like we know that a press needs 17 feet for a, a forklift to load it and then back up without hitting whatever's behind it. Um, I, it wasn't our winery, but I know some have very narrow, like. Uh, I think, well, no, it was at Adelson we figured 16 feet was what we needed, and we needed 17 feet for uh, the case goes, because, you know, uh, you back up the forklift, and if you hit the case behind you, it's, you know, it gets expensive. So we were a little short there. <laughs> They're very careful. Um, uh, let's see, so I'm trying to think, you know, Post post uh, distemming sorting is relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, takes up more room, so you know we need to know if they want to do that. The big one is over vintaging. You know, if mm -hmm. uh, you basically double your your uh, even if you you know miss it by a month, you uh, you need twice the storage you would need otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with the projects in general. Um, you know, when people Come to clients, come, potential clients come to us and ask us, you know, how long it'll take. Um, we'll say, well, harvest 
if you miss harvest 22, it's going to have to be harvest 23. Mm -hmm. So we work backwards from there um, because if you miss it by a day, you might as well miss it by year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's not always easy to make them realize that you know a year and a half in advance isn't enough mm -hmm. in most cases because you got to go through land use and you know you got to leave a year to build it depending on the complexity. Mm -hmm. You know. I think uh, Lemelson was the quickest one we've ever done. That was, I think we got the job in January and had it for harvest, but I don't think you could do that these days. That's you know? incredible. Yeah, land, land uses take six weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. Bridling permits take longer. I mean, funny story with Yamhill County, when we did Adelsheim, we, we said, gave him the drawings and said, so how long do you think it'll take to review them? And when will we get a building permit? He said, oh, you can start. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't do that today. But uh, yeah, he says, oh, just start building. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. <laughs> but then he turned around in two weeks and gave us the permit. Yeah. He stays at six or eight. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so, anyway. I'm curious about working with clients. Obviously, you're 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 trying to balance your abilities and and, and your experience with their desires and experience. Tell me about that kind of that re building that relationship with a client. And have you had jobs that you've turned down because you just couldn't make that work? Yes. <laughs> um, you know what? The, I mean, our attitude to the client hires us for our expertise, and you know, if they're not going to listen to us, you know. You know, we give them every benefit of the doubt, but in some cases, which will remain nameless, mm -hmm. you know, we just say, you yeah, know, we're done. I can think of two in particular, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's a yeah, client that, frankly, it's the clients that, the clients that we enjoy most are the ones who, you know, kind of started as winemakers or owners and, you know, have been at it for a while, know exactly what they want, that, that they're great. I can think of a few, David, mm -hmm. Elihi, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're just a joy to work with, you know, they listen to you when they should, they don't when they shouldn't, <laughs> you know, and the other ones who are like, you know, just come to come into winemaking because they have a lot of money and think that would be a cool trophy, uh, they're difficult. Mm -hmm. so. That's as much as I'll say on that. That's <laughs> perfect answer. Yeah. Uh, as you look back, then you've you've built a lot of a lot of wineries, a lot of different styles, a lot of different places. Are there favorite projects? Not necessarily favorite buildings, but favorite projects that you look back on fondly, either for the finished product or for even just for the process of, of creating it. Um, well, certainly, Ilahi for both mm -hmm. uh, the Brad and team are just a delight to deal with. And we're actually doing a tasting room for them now. So, oh, awesome. Uh, boy, <laughs> it's our third tasting room we've done for them. The first two uh, just never, never quite, uh, we couldn't quite get them into the, their budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but they got a reasonable loan, we can do it now. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, the. Buildings I like the most are probably Lemelson, Elihi, mm -hmm. um, Martin's Lane's beautiful. We, you know, we weren't the design architects on the building, but we did the process. Mm -hmm. But they did a beautiful job on that. Um, they actually won a national AIA award last year for it. Oh wow! Yeah. That's probably the coolest winery I've been involved with. Um, look at my list. Um, I like the function of Alexana. I think that worked well. Mm -hmm. uh, kudos to Lynn. She thought that through well. Uh, the list is impressive. Yeah, I think those are the, the three I'm proudest of. Mm. Mm. Oh, and, and Abbott claim, of course, and Lingua Franca. Lingua Franca is, it's, uh, you know, it's stripped down, but uh, for what it, for the budget, and I think it's a pretty nice building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk about the industry a bit more in general then. Um, tell me about the, the changes you've seen. Obviously, you're looking at it from a very interesting perspective in terms of the buildings themselves. How has the Oregon industry changed uh, in the time you've been kind of working with it? Uh, and, and how has that most affected you and your work? Um, well, I think I, was, I started to talk about how hospitality has become much, mm -hmm. much bigger. Um, the uh, you know it went from over my dead body to uh, I need a taster before I even have a winery mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. which the first time I think Alexano was the first one we'd ever done that way and we had to do another conditional use on the basis that they would have a winery um, but it, that was a different uh, approach to me you know in terms of what was most important to the owner. Mm -hmm. Um, but even within that, you know, there's, lately there's been a lot of changes in terms of uh, post-COVID tasting rooms. You know, nobody wants a belly up to the bar, a big room. You know, I have tons of people in there. Mm -hmm. They all want you know little smaller spaces, breakout tasting tasting rooms with more personal service. I think the first time I saw that was it. Uh, well, again, David. And I went to, uh, with their hospitality folks, went to California uh, before we did the uh, remodel of the offices mm -hmm. into a tasting room. And that was the first time I'd seen sit-down tastings, you know. Paradox we went to and uh, Quintessa, and, you know, they have very, very uh, personalized service mm -hmm. with small bites, you know, to mm -hmm. go with the wine, which is a no-brainer if you think about it, but people didn't do it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my wife went to uh, the extreme of taking crackers with us when we went wine tasting ten years ago because nobody had any. <laughs> you know, taste three three glasses of wine, you need some something to eat. Mm -hmm. um, I think what else? Uh, so hospitality has become much much uh, more important, and mm -hmm. you know, as a result of that, I think people clients are much more interested in what the winery looks like than they used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it was all about just making the wine in it, making it efficiently. Mm -hmm. so, which makes it more fun for us, frankly. I was going to say, that gives you yeah. some chance to yeah. actually have some yeah. fun with it. Um, what about as you look ahead? You mentioned kind of post-COVID, uh, obviously lots, lots of things changing in the world and, and wine specifically. Um, as you look ahead for the future of the industry and for the, the role, the architectural role in that, what do you see changing next? What, 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 is, what, is, what are the next wineries going to look like? I wish I knew. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it's kind of going both ways. There's a lot of merger and acquisitions going on and the bigger companies, uh, while they put money in hospitality, it's usually separate, you know. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I prefer the hospitality being at the winery, so you kind of get the smell of the winery. If you're tasting the wine, well, you can tour it. Uh, but these days, it seems like there's more interest in, in uh, a production winery that's cheap and tin shed off in the corner and, you know, a fancy, mm -hmm. putting lots of money in the tasting room. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. The, I mean, the, some of our challenges early on. I'm thinking of Lemelson, where you, know, you have the big, pretty massive building, and then you've got a little tiny tasting room. And how do you fit those in the same building? It's always been a challenge. You know, you got residential scale and industrial scale. Mm -hmm. so. Well, let's talk about you then a little bit. Uh, obviously. Uh, You've kind of the, the 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 wine has kind of pulled you through. You've been you've been kind of the winery guy for a while. So tell us about how your career kind of progressed and and how you ended up here at Soderstrom and um, and and what's next for you? Retirement. <laughs> well, congratulations in advance. Then yeah, we got a few months to go. Um, so I mean, I uh, I was. Like I said, we were mostly doing uh, things by word of mouth, and we actually gotten into other things since then. Distilleries have become quite a bit of our work. Uh, 
we do other stuff, but it seems to be falling by the wayside. Mm -hmm. um, so we did uh, like house spirits here in Branch Point Distillery out in uh, Dayton, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Reed, who's kind of become our distillery guy, semi-retired because he couldn't completely retire because he knew the distillery's best. <laughs> so he's still at it, but working part time. Mm -hmm. Um, I, try, I lost the train of it. This is sort of how you how you, you you mentioned kind of early on that you so you'd circled back to Soderstrom after kind of an oh, early. Oh yeah, that was just serendipity. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I just I've stayed in touch with my friend Cameron, mm -hmm. and, and he uh, kind of convinced his partners that we'd be a good mix for their, you know, a new sector for them, mm -hmm. and uh, it's worked out well. I think they've left us pretty much alone to do our thing and, and uh, I think we've you know been able to mm -hmm. make them happy bringing in work and, and mm -hmm. so I think it's been mutual, mutually beneficial mm -hmm. it also allowed me to you know phase out and mm -hmm. be assured that my employees had a place to go mm -hmm. um, so I think on the whole I think everyone's pretty happy mm -hmm. So you mentioned phasing out, uh, retirement coming up soon. Uh, are you? Is it a, re a real retirement or are you? Is it a half retirement? If it's not a real retirement. My wife would shoot me because uh, it was supposed to be quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. She retired. I encouraged her to retire so we could travel because she was a teacher and mm -hmm. you know traveling and school schedules was when everyone else was traveling. Mm -hmm. So I encouraged her to retire on the you know understanding that I'd be retiring shortly thereafter and. Uh, then uh, we signed out with Soderstrom and the, the agreement was I'd stay for four years, so mm -hmm. this is the fourth. Mm -hmm. So where are you headed then? What, what, what are your retirement plans? Uh, just traveling, mm -hmm. do some volunteer work and mm -hmm. no spe specific plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll right. see how COVID goes. Hopefully it'll <laughs> we'll, uh, calm down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't get to that we should have? I was just thinking about, um, yes, awesome. along with visiting other wineries, we did, in fact, I encouraged my employees as well to volunteer mm -hmm. crush places. So, mm -hmm. so they all you know, kind of have had that experience, and, and I've had that experience, and that's invaluable. That's really cool. You realize that, you know, 90% of uh, Winemaking is janitorial, as they say. <laughs> you know, it's uh, hours and hours of cleaning bins and distemmers and things like that. But so, I think uh, it instilled the importance of you know sanitation and, and making sure that it was easy to do. You know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you don't have to squeegee things across the room. You know, things like that. So, you know, so we try and you know think about that when we're designing detail things that. Are, Make it easy. Mm -hmm. Great example is that we came up with a very elaborate. Uh, the trench drains at Limelson have big, uh, big baskets at the end to catch the detritus, mm -hmm. and it turns out that uh, they were almost too heavy for one guy to lift. So, so subsequently, we've made them more of them and smaller, <laughs> but they. Uh, Got to got to make those mistakes as mm -hmm. we talked about. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's nice to, to like you say to see it from that side and to have the experience to know what they're talking about yeah. when they're you know that, that's yeah. really that's really cool. Yeah, I like that. Oh. All right. Well, thank you so much sure. for your time today for sharing your stories with us. Congratulations and ahead on retirement Thanks. coming up. Thanks. Been many many wonderful travels, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay. Thank Deal. you.